real disaster on figures produced by the CGB, not me, have said that 40,000 people will die. Now, Dr. Robert Gale, who treated the patients, the United States cancer expert, has said it will be 100,000. If a nuclear accident occurred in this country of the worst possible proportions, it would be 10 times as great as that. In other words, it could be a million people who could die. The final point I'd like to make is this. No one who talks about the production of nuclear power seems to recall the fact it's operational by uranium, produced by uranium miners who are dying every single week of the year in Namibia. That's a price that I'm not prepared to pay. I would just like to ask Mrs. Gorman. She said that uh, we would look, or she would like to get a uh, hundred percent, or as near as possible, safety in the nuclear industry. Say, for instance, Mrs. Gorman, you got ninety-five percent. That five percent differential could still kill a hundred thousand people. There, I naturally regret that anybody dies as a result of any type of fuel accident or the use of a fuel, whether it's silicosis or whether it's from the use of steam locomotives. And nobody would be in favor of that. That would be a silly suggestion to make. Undoubtedly, we need more research and, uh, and better safety procedures and so on. But I have to emphasize that that is one terrible disaster, that most of the nuclear stations that are operating, both in this country and in many other parts of the world, have not had those levels of accident. They are often due to appalling management and or human error of the workers in those sites. And clearly that needs to be tightened up on. But there seems to be no fuel from which there is no risk. If in fact, eventually, through modern developments and market forces, we develop new technology to harness the sun's energy, all well and good. We all look forward to that. Okay, ben, but ben, right ben, now, we have, must have a source of cheap energy. Do you have energy. a final word on this? Because you haven't come in lately. Yes, I mean, I'm very uh, impressed by the argument, that, particularly from the audience, um, about the, the fears uh, of nuclear power stations. And I certainly um, think that if there's any possible alternative to nuclear power, it should be very uh, carefully considered. And I think that the possibility that Marianne said of, of phasing out these stations I I is something that sh should be considered very seriously. Thank you very much indeed. We'll take another question now to round off our programme uh, on a different theme, but of great importance. Andrew Bell, who is a school pupil, a sixth former, I think. Good evening, Sir Robin. Good evening. I'd like to ask the panel, do they think that a majority of the press represent a balanced and fair view of society and current affairs from which I, as a sixth form student, can benefit? And what papers do they suggest I read? <laughs> Mary Ann Seacott. <laughs> what can I say? You've got a good time. Uh, Why? <laughs> because it's the best newspaper. <laughs> Um, Mr. Murdoch would be delighted to hear you say that. As of my editor. <laughs> uh, I don't think, no, clearly if you look at the editorial columns of Britain's newspapers, you will find that the vast majority uh, is biased towards the right. And I think in some respects that's a shame because there isn't quite as plurist a view of British society as we might like. But what worries me far more is when newspapers' news coverage is biased towards any political party. I think papers are quite free to express their opinion in their editorial columns. I'd like to see more newspapers actually being independent in their news coverage. Do you think the Times is as, as balanced and fair a view of society as Mr. Bell needs? I think it's better than most. Is it as, uh, is it as balanced and as fair, say, as the Daily Telegraph or the Independent? Well, it's very difficult to be completely balanced about society when the vast majority of the journalists are living in London and leading a certain sort of life. I and mean, I think it's quite fair to say that most newspapers, for instance, are too London orientated, they're too metropolitan. We don't really reflect what life is like for a lot of people who live in the countryside, for instance. Yes, but we're talking about national papers. Andrew Bell can't go out That's and That's what I'm saying. They're not entirely national. No, quite. Right. Ben Pimelot? Well, I, I think that the imbalance in the press is grotesque. Uh, at, the, at the present time, and I think it's got much worse. Um, it was not nearly as bad, say, in the 1940s and 1950s, when you had one very major national daily, a popular paper, the Daily Herald, which was um, very much on the left. Um, I think there is a difference between the quality newspapers and the, um, the popular dailies, which, with, the, with that one exception, uh, are uniformly, on not only the right, but the sort of uh, kind of bravado, extreme right. 
Um, but um, I th having said that, I think that newspapers probably matter much less now than they used to in the past. I think television is very much more well, important, which is why, why I think that what's happening to television, what's going to happen to television is so serious. Mr. Andrew Bell obviously doesn't have time to watch television, so he wants to know what well, newspapers he ought to read to really understand. Well, He's you, a what, serious what Well, you should read, uh, as speaking, somebody writes the Sunday Times, you ought to read the Sunday Times. But there, there that only comes down once all the bits in it. But, um, no, I mean, on the daily papers, I mean, I think that um, both The Guardian and The Independent are excellent newspapers. Theresa Gorman. Well, I mean, it, I, I'd be amazed if you've got time to read more than three or four papers in a day, and you can go from the sublime to the gorblimey on both sides. You can go from the mirror through the Guardian and the Independent on one side, and uh, presumably you could go from the Sun through the Times and the Telegraph and the Daily Mail and the Express on the other. If you can get through more than half of those newspapers in a day, I think it'd be a miracle. There may not be an enormous balance, but there's enough for you to get both sides of the story. But I agree, most young people, as you've just told us, spend 28 hours a week watching television. An awful lot of people must spend an awful lot more time in that, because I do about eight hours at the most. So they get their information from so many different sources. Yeah, but, but never, that may be so, but Mr. Bell, and he's not the only school pupil in this oh. audience who's asked the question. Uh, he wants what to know what is the best paper for him to read to have a balanced, intelligent, fair view of society, so he can can know what's going on in the world. Well, he's got to read several, that's the answer. Yes, he ought to get together with his pals and buy more, yes. more than one and, and share Yes, it. absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Arthur Scargill. Well, first of all, I find it astonishing that we've got two people here advocating that you buy Murdoch's newspapers after he sacked 6,000 workers for simply demanding uh, negotiating rights. <laughs> Secondly, let me say that my position is very clear, unequivocal on this. I would urge every single person in this country to read The Morning Star, which is, <laughs> which is, which with all the problems that it may have, is at least owned and controlled by its readers and not a multimillionaire from Australia or America. Do you, do you suggest that Mr. Andrew Bell will get a balanced and fair view of <laughs> current affairs from the daily from the morning star i think he will certainly get a more balanced view from the morning star than he would from any of those owned by individuals like maxwell or murder and secondly i think that he would have an opportunity at least to put a, a point of view in that paper which he wouldn't have in uh, maxwell's papers or murdoch's papers. but maxwell supports would, the labor party you must be joking yeah. <laughs> would, 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 would mr again you're joking would my friend mr bell uh, get a more balanced view of society and the news from the Morning Star than he would, say, the Manchester Guardian or the Independent? In my view, he would, certainly, yes. What do you think, Mr Bell? <laughs> well, I was very interested with what this star, Martha, Mr Arthur Scargill had to say yes. about the Morning Star. I personally read The Guardian, and I don't read The Times for the reason they outlined that they sacked uh, 6,000 yes. workers, which I feel very strongly about. Have you ever read The Morning Star? Sorry? Have you ever read The Morning no, I Star? Are no. you going to now? Yes, I shall certainly take a look. <laughs> are, you going to read it? are you going to read only the Morning Star? No, I think Theresa Gorman made a good point that you have to read a variety of papers, and uh, I shall certainly endeavour to do so. Are there any more points? Yes, sir. Do you think that newspapers should be bought for their content rather than who does or does not publish it and own them? Good point. What do you think about that? Uh? Absolutely. What more can I say? Well, what more could you say? What do you well, think? Well, it's the amazing open-mindedness of Mr. Murdoch that employs lots of uh, sub-editors and editors who don't agree with his point of view. <laughs> Let me just take After a what she said tonight, you must be joking. <laughs> Gentlemen, though. Aren't we living in a capitalist world? Sorry, I missed that. Are we not living in a capitalist world? Uh, I think we are, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't the problem with Theresa Gorman's point of view is that there are more than two points of view, and that's the kind of argument that's kept Thatcher in power for the last ten years. There's more, more than the left and the right in terms of the newspapers and politics. Uh, yes, but uh, what, what conclusion are you drawing from that? Well, she said there were two kinds of papers, those on the left and those on the right. Oh. What about oh, the other points is, of view in well, politics? Well, Mr. Witham Smith would like to think his paper's in the middle, that's the independent. So oh. there, there are all sorts of newspapers. I see. But politics is about controversy. It's about the battle between ideas in society. That's what makes it fun. Wouldn't be any point in being a politician if you didn't have that nice ding dong every day. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you know. Yes. Um, I'd like to disagree with Mrs. Gorman because she says she um, should read several papers a day, and as a 
school student, I can't afford several papers a day. Uh, so I read The Independent, because I think that's really balanced. I, 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 I realise you can't afford several papers every day, but if you've, got a, if you've got a group of people with whom you mix or go to an institution or go to a school, you could perhaps share your library. papers. Yeah, I, read, I read The Guardian as well because yes. I think it's yes. quite good, but I think The Independent is yes. a really good paper. Well, there we, where we come to the end, we'll have to leave it till that meeting our friend Mr Beer referred to uh, in the afterlife in a thousand <laughs> times when, when the programme which you're now on will still be continuing, though possibly wi without me. Um, the, <laughs> thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Next week's question time comes from Dundee, that's in Scotland. Around the table with me, there will be the Right Honourable Paul Channon MP, Secretary of State for Transport, David Blunkett MP, Labour's spokesman on the poll tax, Jim Sillars MP, Scottish nationalist, and a well-connected Scottish Liberal, Mrs Judy Steele. That's it next Sunday's Question Time from Dundee, BBC One, 10 o'clock. Good night to you and sleep well. of an hour on BBC Two, The Late Show will have a photography special charting the rapid development of the medium and reviewing this week's show of photographs at the Victoria and Albert Museum. Here on BBC One, Peter Alice is our host at Turnbury for the start of a new series of international pro-celebrity golf. Every year we try and make a nice introduction. They've had me up the lighthouse, they've had me skipping around all over the place. This year they've got me out on the famous racing yacht drum. It's a well-known fact I get a bit queasy on a damp lawn, so this really is an act of bravery for me. We've got many pro-celebrity friends visiting us again this year. Some old familiar faces uh, who we've enjoyed over the years. Terry Wogan, Henry Cooper, Jimmy Tarver, Bruce Forsyth, and a few new faces as well. Barry Took, we've got Bob Wilson, and a whole host of others. Well, who are our two resident professionals? Well, one of them, in 1987, said... All